Some of you in this room um, are old enough to remember when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were the first men to fly to or land on the moon. If you remember that moment, probably sit in front of a TV somewhere, raise your hand. Wow, there's a lot of old people in here. Wow. <laughs> I was four. I don't remember. <laughs> But it's interesting, um, some 50 years later, right, after the landing of the Apollo 11, and we have seen film footage and um, movies have been made and tons of pictures, um, it doesn't seem like that, that big of a deal, right? I mean, as we've gone back and forth to the moon so many times, the question that kind of comes up is, was it, was it really that was it really that hard? To which I would say, yes. Like anything worthwhile in life, the answer is yes. It was, it was really, really hard. President John F. Kennedy astonished the world on May 25th, 1961, when he announced to Congress that the United States should land a man on the moon by 1970. No group was more surprised than the scientists and engineers at NASA who suddenly had less than a decade in their minds to invent space travel. So when Kennedy announced that goal, no one actually knew how to navigate to the moon. I mean, lots of theories, but they didn't know how to do it. No one knew how to build a, a, a rocket big enough to get them there or a computer small enough. You may recall computers used to be like really, really, really big that would allow them to fly a spaceship there. No one knew what the surface of the moon was like. On that day of Kennedy's historic speech, America had a total of 15 minutes of space flight experience, which is five of those minutes outside the atmosphere. Literally, Russian dogs had more time in space than US astronauts. But, and this is mind-boggling to me, done a little bit of study taking excerpts from the book One Giant Leap by Charles Fisherman. Um, over the next decade, actually eight years, more than 400,000 scientists, engineers, and factory workers, 400,000 would send astronauts to the moon. If you want some more insight to, uh, uh, to how much work behind the scenes went on, you've probably seen it if you haven't watched the movie Hidden Figures for all sorts of reasons. It's a great movie. But just the math problems, just the math team that they needed, right? Just to literally get them there and back. Each hour of space flight, you ready for this? Would require one million hours of work back on Earth to get America to the moon on July 20th, 1969. Was it hard? You bet it was. Did it take effort? A ridiculous amount. This morning as we continue our series in 2 Peter, we're going to be talking about what it means to grow in our spiritual walk with Jesus. So do me a favor, if you haven't already, please open your Bibles and your Bible apps. 2 Peter chapter 1. If you'd like to follow along more closely, you can go to the Version Bible app and you'll see my outline there. It has more notes. You may even get some extra notes in there because I tend to edit up to the last second. So some things will be in there that I won't talk about today. We'll call that bonus material. In our key verse this morning, the Apostle Peter tells us, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, for this very reason, underline these next three words, make every effort. For this very reason, make every effort to add to, to your faith. Just like the Apollo 11 moon landing took over 400,000 people and millions of hours of work to land on the moon, our faith, please hear this, requires hard work to grow in Christ. I think that we've bought into the lie that if it's spiritual, it should be easy. But it's just the opposite. But for some reason, we're like, hey, okay, I'm going to plan my life. And it depends on where you're at in life, your station in life, I get it. But for, for most people, you kind of set goals and you're thinking, I'm going to work, I'm going to save money, I'm going to get in college, I'm going to work really hard, I'm going to get a degree, I've got a plan, I'm going to get my master's, I've got a plan, I may get married, I've got a plan, I'm going to buy a house, I've got a plan, I'm going to work hard, 
I mean, like, I'm going to drive up to Kansas City and buy Ikea furniture. I'm going to spend a thousand hours putting that together. I'm going to, I'm going to look at a million TV shows, HGTV, as well as magazines and internet stuff just to know how to design my house. I think we've bought into the lie that if it's spiritual, it should be easy. You know, like, uh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus now. I think, I think I'll just wing it. Like somehow, like the, the Holy Spirit is just going to float down on a spirit cloud and just make us do spiritual things. If it's spiritual, it's going to require every effort on our part to walk with Jesus. Why? Because as Jim said last week, we have three enemies that never take a break. They don't take a nap. There's no retirement for them. We have this world system which is often countercultural to the word of God. Not always, but often. It's countercultural to how we think and, and what the spirit of God wants to do in us. We have our own flesh, which we fight and struggle with. As Paul says in Romans 7, like the things I should do, I don't. The things I don't do, I do. And oh man, it's a struggle. And then we have an enemy. His name is Satan. He's the great deceiver. He's the accuser of the brethren. So those three things are constantly barraging us. And let me add this. I know sometimes, you know, we don't like to talk about this, but, but one day... Every quote-unquote eagle in this room is going to land in eternity, and God is going to ask us, did you make every effort to grow in Jesus? He's less concerned about, not that this is a bad thing, your 401k, how you designed your house, the Ikea furniture that you got or didn't get. He's just less concerned. Now, are those things worthwhile? Sure. Sure. Are they the most important things? No. One day, every eagle in this room is going to land in eternity. Whether we like it or not, that's how it goes. We're born to die. And the God of the universe is going to ask us, did you make every effort? We're talking about the moon. We put people on the moon. Okay, that's a big deal. That's a ridiculous amount of time and effort. But for you, I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about the stuff that matters. You say, well, Lee, where do you get that? Where does it say that God's going to ask us that? Romans chapter 14, verse 11. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. Verse 12, so then each, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And I already know what some of you are thinking. I think the same thing. Is it all up to me to grow spiritually? I mean, I, I, I can't do this on my own. And, and the answer is, is no. It's not all up to you. And yes, you're right, you can't do this on your own. So we must keep two truths in balance all the time. They need to be at the forefront of our mind. Number one is this. God is committed to our growth. I got God on my side. By faith, in Christ, I can't do this without you. I can't. There's no way, I mean, I can try, but it'll get old and tired, and I can't, that's number one. But number two, this is just as important, it's the mystery. We must be committed to our growth. God save us from, I'm just going to wing it. Like, does anything ever good, anything of lasting value, anything that matters in life ever come about through, hey, I think I'll just wing it. Hold my beer, watch this. Does that ever turn out good? You didn't see that coming, did you? That never turns out well. Here's the mystery of spiritual growth. I, I love this, and yet I don't quite understand it, but I walk in it. God has designed it so that we work in partnership with him. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You say, whoa, that's on me. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That's on God. 
Having said all that, it's not a 50-50 arrangement, but it's 100% us and 100% God. We're 100% responsible, responsible for our spiritual growth, and we are 100, please hear this, we are 100% dependent on the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and gives us the grace and ability to grow. All right, let's look at our text this morning so we can see how to make it happen. Just a caveat here, we're doing, sometimes we do this when we go through a book of the Bible, we do what we call a series within a series. This is a mini two-part series. I get the first part, and that is what I'm gonna call basically um, the stair steps of sanctification. Eight qualities that we need to walk in so we can grow in Christ. Next week, Kevin's coming back up, and he's gonna get super, super proud. I think today's practical, but even more practical. He's gonna take us back to our drink, Drinking Deep series, and he's gonna talk about what it looks like to actually walk with Christ, sanctification, step by step, break that down. So I get the first part this morning. Second Peter chapter one in verse five, for this very reason. Now, what is Peter doing here? Well, he's doing some review. He says, for this very reason, meaning let's look back at the first four verses. He does this often in this letter. For this very reason, because of our new birth and divine power and precious promises offered to us freely in Christ, we cannot sit back and do nothing. For this very reason, he says, we're, we're called to make every effort to add to our faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Peter lays out eight qualities that are essential for our spiritual growth. He starts with faith, and he, he ends with love, but, but the question is, why does he start with faith? You might want to write this down. I didn't put it up there, but I'll go slow. Because without faith, none of the other qualities matter. You say, well, wait a second. I mean, this still would be nice. It would be nice. I don't mind if my, my neighbor who doesn't know Jesus wants to live this way. That's great. They make us a better person, but a better person without Jesus is still a person without Jesus. That's the danger, right? The danger is we settle. We're like, here's what I do. Here's what I do. Like, our, our world, our culture is so rough and perverse and broken, even some of the things that Chris was saying in his announcements, really good, that I'm like, hey, if my neighbor is just a good person, good enough. Wow. Don't care for your soul, but hey, don't steal from me. Good enough. By faith and dependence on the Holy Spirit, all the other qualities that we're gonna look at not only come into focus, but they're actually doable and they're sustainable. And get this, they produce spiritual fruit. Like the stuff that I'm doing matters. Okay, first quality. Jump on me to the stair steps of sanctification. Uh, first quality is faith. As I said earlier, everything starts with, with faith. Recently, um, and this breaks my heart, I've noticed a trend for the last five to seven years Recently in our culture, the concept of having faith has come under attack, not by the world, that's always been the case, but faith has come under attack by those who claim to be faithful. Huh? That's like the ice cream maker not liking ice cream. Say what? Like what's happened? Let me lovingly remind us of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. The apostle Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for we live by What? Say, say it one more time, I didn't hear that. We live by faith and not by Wow. It's so simple, it's profound. Something has shifted in our culture where all of a sudden those who claim to be the faithful are shocked by things like, and I'm quoting from comments I've heard from other people. God created the heavens and the earth. Whoa, mind blowing. The parting and crossing of the Red Sea can't happen, impossible. The virgin birth, whoa, not scientific. And even the resurrection, whoo, really? I'm like, you're supposed to be the faithful. Really? When explaining the gospel last week, Jim repeatedly said, I wrote this phrase down. He said, and I quote, 
there are some things I don't understand. Hey, welcome to Christianity, but I accept them by faith. Hey, there are a lot of things that are, man, I see it. The heavens declare, the heaven, I, I see it. There are a lot of things that are verifiable, but, but there's some things we walk in faith. We walk in faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is what provides the foundation for spiritual health. Without that foundation, none of the other steps matter. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whoa. Why? Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, faith, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's faith. Second quality, goodness, goodness. Uh, the, the King James, I don't think many people probably use the King James anymore. It translates this word virtue. Probably the best translation would be, it literally means moral courage. Moral courage. God, goodness is knowing what is right and then having the courage to do it. At the time that Peter is writing this letter, Nero is the emperor of Rome. You know that. We talked about that. And he was, uh, he was a bad guy. He was a murderer and a sexual deviant. He fit right in with Roman society with all its moral decadence and bribery, murder, dishonesty, prostitution, idol worship. Um, if there was a sin that could be imagined, they were doing it. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Like, I confess, I get it. I'm old guy. I get it. But, I mean, I grew up in a pagan culture in a pagan family filled with debauchery um, in Southern California, enough said. And so uh, I'm like, I, I watch the news, I get on the internet, I watch a movie, I talk with people, I have people in my office, I have coffee with somebody, and I'm like, there's no way our culture is this bad. Guess what? In one way, shape, or form or another, it's, it's always been that bad. In the world we live in today, goodness means, ready for this, having the courage to do what's right even when people are doing just the opposite. It takes courage to say, not going to do that. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to go down that path. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to do it. Third quality, knowledge. Knowledge. The word knowledge here is similar to the one Jim mentioned last week. In the original, it's the word gnosis, and it refers to experiential knowledge and not merely a passing acquaintance. In other words, gnosis, knowledge is, is application, and thus it's not surprising that it grows best in the field of obedience. So here's the question, how do we, how do we know God? Uh, we, we read the word of God, like every day. Can I just, very simply, this is what, what, what I do. I, I get up in the morning, I make my way into the kitchen, I take way too many vitamins. It's crazy the amount of vitamins I take now. It's like, I, I hope they're doing good, I don't know. It's just an exercise in swallowing for me, right? <laughs> While I'm doing that, I've, I've hit my espresso maker on. I'm making my espresso. You're like, dude, too much detail. Okay, but I get my espresso, which I make a, 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 a Americano because I don't want just the hard espresso. I want water with that. And then I, I, I stumble into my study and sitting right there on the corner of my desk next to my chair of prayer is my two-year um, Bible reading plan. And there's a pen that sits right on top of that. And I take that and I check the day. So today I, I read 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapters 19 and 20. And then I read Psalm 64. And before I read it, I sit my rear end down in my chair of prayer with my coffee and I pray. And I say, oh God, give me understanding. Give me knowledge of, of what I'm about to read. And then I confess sin and I pray for my family and I pray for you. And, and then I read the word of God and I meditate and I think about it. I infuse knowledge by an act of my will each and every day. Do I wake up floating on a spirit cloud? Woohoo! Every single, yeah, baby, give me the word. It's six o'clock. No, I don't. Do I have those moments? Sure. More often than not. 
sit down, check, pray, read. And then something supernatural happens. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and begins to wreck me, ruin me, change me, encourage me, challenge me. I'm making every effort, y'all. I'm making every effort. I don't ever go, dude, I'm a pastor. I don't need, I've been to seminary. I can mail this in. I, I don't need today's man. I got yesterday's man. I, I don't do that. I can't. He said, well, Pastor Lee, you're so spiritual. No, 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 I'm not so spiritual. Oh, wretched man that I am. Every single day I contend. Every day. It's not real sexy. I just get up and do it. So how do we know God? We read his word. We study it. We memorize it. We meditate on it. We discuss it. And then we prayerfully seek to obey and understand how it applies in the daily experience of my life. God, how does this work with Ruth and I? We're 31 years into this adventure. How does it work? I've got sons. I've got a daughter-in-law. I've got a son with a girlfriend. I've got family. How does it work? Help me, God. I need your knowledge. This is why the prophet Hosea said this. Are you ready for this? Hosea chapter four and verse six. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Man, the children of Israel are like, we can wing it. We are the elect children of the most high God. We're pretty special. I think we'll run after other idols. I think we'll get seduced by culture. I think we'll wing it. How'd that work out? How'd that work out? I know what you're saying, Lee. Man, this is hard. Hello, landing on the moon. It's hard. Great quote by J.I. Packer. Forgive me, first service I said he was dead. He's still alive, but he's almost dead, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Super blind, has cancer, like 98,000 years old, but... Uh, he said, boy, you're rough. I'm not rough. He gets to be with Jesus any minute now. Praise God. <laughs> Knowledge of the Holy, J.I. Packer says this, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the best thing in life, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Knowledge of God. Knowledge of God. Fourth quality. Self-control. I actually love this. I just, I, I've never thought of it this way, but you do a deep dive into what this word really means. It literally means to hold oneself still like this. But it's used, it's used with running track. Like the ancient runners. Who, who runs track and who's run track in here? And you literally, you're, I, I didn't run track. I played every sport, but I didn't do that. And you're, I won't even get that low. I don't think I can. But you know, you know, you get down and you stay still. And what do you wait for? The gun. And what happens if you jump the gun? You're disqualified. Whoa. It was a word used to describe a runner crouched at the start of a race. The ability to stay still and motionless is the control that we need to face temptation. Let me give you an example. Uh, many, a long time ago in a church far, far away in, in Texas, as an elder, I used to meet with a group of deacons. And I was one of six other elders and once a month, as elders, we met once a month, and then another week, we met with the deacons once a month. And I'll, I'll just be real candid. None of you, none of you know that church, and, and uh, I'm sure it's gotten better. But when we would meet with the deacons, uh, it would get a little bit, um, let me just say this. My very first meeting there, um, a, a deacon threatened to throw the chair at another deacon. I know, it's Texas. Yeah, please forgive them. And I was there for four and a half years, and we didn't have any more chair-throwing events, but every, almost every single month, I, I went to that deacon meeting, I dreaded it, because there's going to be arguments and fights, and, but here's one thing I noticed. There's this one gentleman who later became one of my closest friends, still is. At the time, he was in his early 30s, he was the deacon. 
And I would watch him as we were all arguing and debating and talking and getting out of hand. He would just sit there calmly, almost like a runner, right, waiting for the gun, just calmly, just exhibiting self-control. And I'd watch him taking notes. And invariably, when everyone talked themselves out, he would say, hey, can I suggest something? And he would give, out, give us the most spirit-filled, godly plan ever, like every single time. Self-control is learning to master our moods and passions rather than being controlled by them. Self-control means we don't say stuff like this. That's just the way I am. Right? It's learning to master our moods and passions so that when we have moods and we will, things like anger, impatience, sexual passions, right? That's a big one today. I feel this, it must be okay, sexually. When those things take place, when those things are expressed, instead of giving in to those, we live those things out according to God's word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we say no. No. Fifth quality, perseverance. Perseverance literally means to abide under. It has a, a couple of different roots involved. It goes different directions. It means to remain under discipline. It also means, which I think is really cool, to actively stay on course. It was a word that sailors used to stay under the North Star when sailing their ships at night. The temptation is that when the waves are fierce and the wind is high, the temptation is to alter our direction. But perseverance keeps us on course. This word also has in it uh, what's known as a, a forward look. That is the ability to focus on what is beyond our current cultural pressures and circumstances. Jesus is our example. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse one. Therefore, and he's referring back to all these saints that have gone before him. Not perfect, but they persevered, right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now get this, and let us run with perseverance. Same word, same word in our second Peter text. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. How do we do that? We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured, again, same word as our text. The cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You say, how do I run this race? You look at Jesus. You look at Jesus. As Jesus ran his race, he looked forward. How do I run my race? I look at Jesus. That's how I run my race. I look forward. A theme throughout the New Testament over and over and over again is hope. Hope in what? Eternity. I look towards eternity. Man, if, if you're trying to make this spinning orb your heaven, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. I know, if you're under 35, you're looking at me like, yeah, yeah, right. If you're over 35, you're like, this world will disappoint It will. It doesn't mean there's not joy. It doesn't mean there's not some cool things. It doesn't mean there's not life abundant. It just means there's also pain, sorrow, heartache, death, misery. They're all mixed together. So when those, those waves are massive and the wind starts to blow, we will be tempted to redirect our course and follow after something else. Stay fixed, Jesus says. Look at me. Look at me. I remember I'd come off the field many years ago, many pounds ago as a, as a fiery, angry quarterback. My, and I'd be mad at something and my coach would grab my face mask and look me in. Look, look at me. Just look at me. Stay focused. Come on. Come on. Hear my words. Hear my voice. Here's what we need to do. Stop. Calm down. That's what we do when we persevere. We look at Jesus. We look at Jesus. Sixth quality. Godliness. Again, the word in the original means, and I didn't know this until I did a deep dive, it means to act like royalty. Act like royalty. In other words, when an ambassador, the emperor, officially represented the Roman Empire, they behaved in a way that would reflect well on their boss. 
Godliness describes a lifestyle of showing reverence for God as we live before others, especially those without Jesus. We act like daddy. <laughs> Why? Because we're his representative. The question for us is this, but do we give in to the cultural darkness around us or do we express the fact that we are serving a higher king than the one who's over this world? Simply put, godliness is living life with God. It means I draw on his wisdom, his power, his forgiveness. As, as Jim said last week, his divine power. I live in purity, calmness, courage, and confidence in the midst of whatever may come. Seventh quality, mutual affection. Some of you have translations that say brotherly kindness. Probably a better translation than mutual affection because the word used here is Philadelphia, which means a love for the brethren. Regardless, it's a family love. And it means feeling what others feel, personally taking on their burdens, their concerns, their hurts, their expectations. It means to share with each other practically, spiritually. It means to pray for each other. It means to, that we watch our attitudes and words about and towards each other. We're in the family together. You're like, yeah, dude, my family's horrible. I, but you're in a new family now. You're in a new family. Your brothers and sisters have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. They've got the divine power. They've got the promises. They've got the righteousness of Christ. They're walking in these eight spiritual qualities. And so are you. Last quality, love. This is the, the pinnacle of all the other spiritual qualities. It ties and binds them together. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 16, John says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. You, you know the word that Peter uses here. It's, it's pretty common it's the word agape, it's, it's unconditional love, it's sacrificial, it's difficult. It means we're to give up ourselves for someone else. Jesus laid down his life for us. And this is important that we make, um, make a distinction here. This love is personal and specific. Often what we do when it comes to the word love as believers, we say things like this, I love everybody. That means you don't love anybody, right? personally. I just, I, I just love everyone. We go macro. Macro is real easy to go macro. So if you go macro, you can say things like this person said to me last week. They said, my spouse, they love everybody. They just don't like to be around anybody. I'm like, what? And somehow we go, oh yeah, I get it. Jesus doesn't get that. The devil wants to keep us in the macro. We throw out platitudes like, oh yeah, everyone's my, I just love every. Who are you loving individually? Who are you dying for? Who are you crying for? Who are you praying for? Who are you holding up? I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He's so British. The British are so great. They say things and uh, literally, they, they insult you, but it, it takes a day to figure it out, right? <laughs> You're like, what just happened? Well, hey, a week later, right? <laughs> C.S. Lewis says this. He says, and I quote, it is easier to be enthusiastic about humanity, macro, than it is to love individual men and women. Now, this is where it gets interesting, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, I love this, are just not very good looking, just unattractive. <laughs> The devil likes to keep it in the macro. Jesus is like, let me crawl right where you're at. Be right where you're at. Let me wash your feet. Hey, you hit this cheek, hit this cheek. That's love. That's love. That's agape. So when we hear believers say things like, yeah, I, I love that person. I don't like them. No, 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 no. Yeah, that people group, eh, I don't know. Uh, no, no, God is a spirit. We worship in spirit and truth. He sees no color. He sees no 
people group. He just sees people. Right? Right? So what does love look like? Four words. It looks like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. Eight qualities for spiritual growth. So what are we going to do with them? When someone tells me they want to make a change, um, I often ask this question. It's a question I ask myself. How badly do we want to get better? Because people get caught up in a moment all the time. I'll have, usually men, almost always men, because I'm a man, they'll come to me and they'll be like, my life's a mess. My life's a wreck. I, I need to be discipled. I need to be mentored. I need someone to come alongside me. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, here's what you need to do. I, I want you to keep a journal. I want you to read this. I want you to pray this. I want us to study this. We're going to meet. We're going to talk. It's going to get real. It's going to get hard. We're going to make every effort together. About this percentage makes it. About this many either go, no, thank you, or they get in a couple weeks and they go, yeah, I just want to hang out. I don't want to get up at six and get in my chair of prayer and, and read Second Chronicles. I don't want to do that. You got something easy? So I'll ask each of us this morning, how badly do we want to grow? Sadly, the majority of people just go, thanks, but no thanks. This is enough. I'll show up once or twice on a Sunday during the month and uh, I'll listen to some podcasts. Meh. I got other things to do. I love this quote by Thomas Akempis from The Imitation of Christ. It's so powerful, it's so scary. He says this, and I quote, a religious person that liveth not according to discipline lies open to great mischief and the ruin of their soul. He that seeketh liberty and ease shall ever live in distress. Why? For one thing or another will displease them. You ever see that? The people sitting on the sidelines, never get in the game, never embrace the battle, never are living out the eight spiritual qualities aren't on the stair steps, so to speak, they're the biggest critics. They're the biggest victims. They're the biggest unhappy, pardon my bad grammar, they're the most unhappy people ever. What about this? I don't know, and so and so, blah, blah, blah. Let's get in the game. Discipline yourself. Get on the stairway to sanctification. Kevin's gonna really hit that hard next week. You do not want to miss that talk. It's gonna be powerful. In verses 8 through 11, Peter finishes with two promises for us. I think they're powerful. If we diligently work in making these happen in our lives, there are two things we can expect to have it happen. Promise number one is the promise of purpose. Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Wow. Peter writes that if we possess, let me go positive here. Peter writes that if we possess these eight qualities, we will not live ineffective and unproductive lives. In other words, our lives will matter. Don't you want your life to matter? But, if we're not diligent about these qualities, then we're going to be blind to spiritual realities. In other words, we'll be clueless about the big picture. That is, we're going to miss out on the spiritual battle that is right in front of us. Peter is saying that if we ignore these eight qualities, it's like we've forgotten that Jesus is our Savior. You ever been around believers like that? It's almost like Jesus is a distant relative. You're like, what happened to you? Yeah, I remember him. Oh, it was, yeah, it was in college and I used to be, but now, uh. Peter says, if you don't walk on this stair step of sanctification, pretty soon you'll be like, what did Jesus do for me? We'll forget that he's purified our sins. We'll forget that he saved us for a purpose. 
So let me encourage us. We may not always see it, but if we live out these eight qualities in increasing measure, we're going to make a difference in this world, in our homes, our families, our jobs, our schools. If we're diligent about these qualities, our lives will have purpose. That's a promise. Second promise, the promise of his presence. Verse 10, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, Lee, what's going on here? These verses make me a little nervous. Peter is encouraging us to make even more certain in our minds and hearts the truth upon which our faith is based. How do we do that? Verse 10, again. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. What things? The eight qualities we just looked at. If we live out these qualities, then we will never stumble. In the Greek, it's a double negative. Here's a better translation. I want you to see this. For if you do these things, you will never, ever, no, not ever stumble. You say, why is that encouraging? Because what Peter is saying here is if you do these things, you're never going to worry about losing your salvation. If you're in the game... You're confessing sin, you're asking to live by the Spirit, you're practicing goodness, and, and you're practicing love and mutual affection, and these things are in your life. You don't even have time to stop and think, am I really a child of God? You're just too busy being a child of God. And it gets better, he says, when you do that, the result is God's presence. Verse 11 again. If you do these things, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Presence forever with Jesus. Last thought, God has given us an incredible gift, eternal life, eternal life, and all that's involved in a relationship with him today, God has also given us by the power of the Holy Spirit all that we need to grow in that relationship. Practically, it means as followers of Jesus, we make every effort to pursue Faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. I can't think of a better segue this morning for our ministry fair than the talk we just had. In other words, now that these qualities, these spiritual disciplines are evident in our lives, go flesh them out using your gift in service for Jesus' bride, the church. So what I want to encourage you as we get ready to wrap up here this morning, we're going to continue to worship. We're going to have communion. There's going to be a time of prayer. As a matter of fact, if I could have those on the prayer team come on up right now, I'm going to be, encourage you to be thinking about at the end of the service to walk around this room and, and, and look at all these various tables. And it's not just a table, it's a ministry. That means there, there are people involved. There are God stories involved. The Holy Spirit's at work at each one of these tables from celebrate recovery to, to setting up a chair to children's to a potter's house to equipment. We can go on and on and on. And God only made one of you and he gave you at least one gift, most likely two or three, and he's like, man, what are you going to do with it? As you're walking up the stair step of sanctification, how is it fleshed out practically? We don't do ministry fair for us. You go, well, yeah, it kind of helps you. It does, but more so, as your shepherds, we do it for you. You don't have to. You get to serve our great God and King. Let's pray. If you don't mind, if you could just bow your heads. And if you're here this morning, and I know, I think and pray it's the majority of you, you're like, man, Lee, I love Jesus. I do. And for many in this room, you're like, I get it. I'm not perfect, but by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, I am stepping into those eight qualities on a daily basis. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray for you. For others in this room, you're like, I've been, I, I've been sitting on the sideline. I've been consumed by school, work, stuff, sex, addictions. I've just been consumed. I know it's wrong. The Holy Spirit is working me over. Today is the day of repentance. Here's what, here's what the devil says. You can never change. 
Here's what the Spirit says. Come on, let's do it right now. Arms wide open. Love you. Come on, son or daughter. Come on. Don't listen to the devil. He's a liar. Listen to the Spirit of truth. Let's get busy about kingdom business. If you're like, I, I want to do that, make a decision in your seat. You don't have to tell anybody. Just show it by your life. Now, you may say, I, I need someone to pray for me. Well, that's the prayer team's up here. We want to pray. Others in this room, you're like, Lee, this is an awkward talk for me. You keep talking about living for Jesus. I don't even know Jesus. That's a whole other discussion. I'm glad you're here. Been where you're at. Totally understand. If you're interested in about who Jesus is, not the church, not a denomination, not a set of rules, but who Jesus is, again, come talk to someone on the prayer team. I would encourage you, we have Bibles at the communion tables. Grab a Bible, take it home. It's a free gift from us to you. Read the Gospel of John. It's in the New Testament. To the right, if you open up your Bible. Father, thank you. Thank you that we don't have to. We get to be in the game. We get to serve the king in his kingdom. We get to do the stuff that matters. We get to live life with purpose. Been there, God, where my life was purposeless miserable, suicidal, addictive, sad, depressed. Now I got a purpose to serve the king and his kingdom and I don't want to stop. God, I pray that that carries over to every person in this room who claims to know and love you. They'll not listen to the lies of the liar, but they'll listen to the spirit of truth and they'll do what you've called them to do, God. You set them apart for a purpose, God. Unleash them, Father. And God, for those in this room who are like, I don't know Jesus, I pray today would be their day of salvation. At the very least, the first step in their journey towards finding peace and freedom and salvation in Jesus. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen.